Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with number two in our series of how to listen to great music and the work that we are working our way through. The work we're working, yes, the work that we are gradually sashaying our way through is the suite number one from Grieg's incidental music to Ibsen's play Peer Gint. Boy, is that a mouthful. So we just call it the Peer Gint Suite number one, or the Peer Gint Suite. Or in this case, we're going to listen to the second number, which is called Ozzy's Death. Now, Ozzy is Peer's mother. And she dies in Act 3. He comes home and he's with her as she passes away. It's a very, very touching scene. And this is a particularly beautiful piece of music. Four minutes long, scored only for muted strings. And the only people who play. And it's unforgettably lovely. But the reason I'm playing it, because each one of these pieces teaches us something about great music. It reveals to us one of these qualities that music has that you can't find anywhere else and that if you're going to enjoy and understand great music you have to start to develop a feeling for and the way you develop that feeling as i've said is simply by listening to stuff you don't have to study anything and it's particularly true of this piece because the quality in question is harmony Oh, my God, harmony. Oh, it's such a, you just say harmony, you just go, oh, God, no, not harmony. It's such a, a difficult subject in the musical world. The reason, of course, is because it's a purely musical quantity, which has been thoroughly, and I mean thoroughly, mapped out, investigated, organized, and generally in an academic sense, categorized just like the periodic table of the elements. I mean, the rules of harmony, the structure of harmony, the names for all the possible combinations of notes that make harmony, they're all fixed. And it's a language, it's a jargon, I mean, an English language, <laughs> German, whatever language you're in, it's a academic language that, that you have to learn when you study harmony. And the rest of us don't have to care about it, but you'll hear it. You hear bits of it, bits of it all over the place. You hear about inverted chords and seventh chords and this and that and dominance and, and Neapolitan sixths and, and plagal cadences. And, you know, there's all of this language that involves or describes certain tried and true practices in the field of harmony. And when something gets done enough times, eventually it acquires a name. And people who study it know those names. People who don't study it don't know those names. The important thing about harmony is that harmony is like plumbing. I mean, that's the way to think about it, I think. It really is. It, in other words, it's infrastructure. It's the musical infrastructure. Now, you can analyze it till the cows come home. And I don't deny the fascination of the academic study of harmony. I mean, it's a fascinating topic. And it is this amazing, uniquely musical quality because it gives music so much of its expressivity, its power to move us. It comes from harmony. And it comes from melody as well. But the two are related. They're very, very intimately related. And, you know, C.P.E. Bach, I think, really said it best. He said, a melody, C.P.E. Bach said, he said, a melody is the surface manifestation of a scheme of underlying harmonies. In other words, you have a sequence of chords. You know, chords, you know, it's a group of notes all played at once. That's what, that's what, and when you play more than one note at the same time, you get harmony. Or if you play them one after the other and they have a certain relationship to each other, you get harmony. It's, it's an inevitable quality of, of writing or listening to music or making music. You always get harmony unless you're only in unison. And even unison meaning just one, like a Gregorian chant, one line of melody with no other things. But even that, even that has implied harmony. The harmony may not be written, but the flow of the melodic lines suggests certain relationships between the notes, and those relationships can be described in terms of harmony. So harmony is everywhere in music. It defines what music is. It, it defines 
exactly how the music is going to affect you. But here's the thing. And this is why you don't have to worry about it. And it's not just because I'm a complete ignoramus when it comes to harmony. I really am. I mean, I never studied it. I never studied harmonic theory. And and whenever I do, it, it, uh, my my eyes cross. And, and I, I, it's just one of those topics. It's, you know, it's like geometry. Some things you just don't get. And, and you know, I was very good at math. I, I, I got through calculus. I mean, I, I was a mathematician. I, I really enjoyed math. But geometry, for some reason, I just couldn't get. I didn't have any spatial sense. Well, harmony is like that. I hear it. It moves me. I love it. But do I want to study it? No, I don't think so. And that's just me. I mean, you know, you can go study it if you want to. It, I, I've tried. I've really tried. So I know a lot of the terminology, but... <laughs> You know, how it works, who the heck knows? But here's the point that I want to make, which is this. Just as people have no clue why certain melodies strike us as moving or original or expressive, they also have no idea why harmony affects us at all. You can describe it. You can describe it a million different ways. You can describe it in excruciating detail. But what we really want to know is, why does this harmony matter to us? What does it do for us? And all you can say is that it just does. <laughs> I mean, you know, you can, you can, you know, you make a chicken or the egg circular argument. You know, well, this moves us because it's a, this sequence of chords. Therefore, this sequence of chords moves us this way. I mean, it's circular logic. It doesn't explain why. I don't know. It just does. And so great music must necessarily have great harmony. But what does great harmony mean? I mean, what does that mean? Harmony is, it's such a basic quality. And the piece we're going to hear by Grieg, Ozzy's Death, is exactly of that type, that you can't quite understand why it does what it does. Now, let me describe the piece to you a little bit. Let's play some samples and you'll, you'll see exactly what I mean and exactly why you don't have to worry about plumbing. Well, you don't have to worry about that, this musical infrastructure. All you have to worry about what it does. You don't have to worry about how it does it. And, you know, and don't ever confuse the two. Now, this, is, this piece of music consists of the same melody, the same tune played five times three times right side up and two times upside down. That's the piece, essentially. However, each time we hear the melody, it's harmonized slightly differently. It's also played in different registers and it's played in with different volume, with different dynamics. But the harmony is always a little bit different and a little bit unexpected, even though the tune is the same. The tune is unbelievably simple. The tune consists of two halves, and, and each half has exactly the same shape, basically, but a slightly different ending. The first half is open-ended. In other words, it ends, it ends in a place where you don't feel that it's, it's, it's stopped. It has to go on. And here, this is again the Malmo Symphony Orchestra with uh, Biarte Engeset, or maybe the Royal Scottish National Orchestra. They're both in here in this Naxo series of complete Greek orchestral music. I'm going to play the first half of the melody, the open-ended part, and then the second half of the melody, which comes to rest. It comes to a full, full close before moving on because that's what harmony does. It also provides musical punctuation. The first half of the melody ends in a comma. The second half ends in a period. Here they, here's the first half of the melody. And here's the second half of the melody that ends with a period.
So it's not just the beautiful harmony underlying the melody that makes it so impressive. It's the fact that Grieg is using harmony to keep the music moving or stop it entirely. Why does the harmony do that? Well, because this we can explain. We can explain, you know, how it works because certain chords relate to certain other chords in a scheme of harmonies, in a key or a tonality. And so if you stop at one, if you're in one key and you stop in a chord that seems to not want to be in that key, you have to keep going till you get back to where you started. And that's what the second half of this tune does. It takes us back to where we started. And then there's a period, the first sentence is over, and Grieg plays the melody again, only slightly differently each time he does it. And it's just the most simple and elegant and gorgeous thing. But what makes the harmony so wonderful, what makes it so wonderful is that the theme itself is nothing without the harmony. The theme is do, 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 ya, da, da, ya, da, 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 da. I get yeah, it's a pretty tune, but how many tunes can we think of that begin? Do, 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 do. It's nothing. It's nothing without that harmony. But when you put the harmony in, you go, ah, it's Grieg. It's his harmony. And that's what makes it great music. The harmony is distinctive. It's not only distinctive as Grieg, it's distinctive as it turns that very simple, not terribly you know, remarkable melody into something astonishing and expressive. And he plays it so many different ways. It's soft, it's loud, the harmony changes. Sometimes it's dissonant. That means, you know, it sounds sort of mean or harsh or, you know, sometimes it's very mellow. And then when he turns the theme upside down, oh my, what a difference. That is the moment, of course, when Ozzy dies. And the opening theme, the way it's written originally in its right side up version, is is striving for the light. Do, do, do. Each phrase seems to be reaching upward, but then she passes away or she gives up the fight and it sinks downward. And so I want to play you right now just, just the first phrase of that melody. The first phrase, and ja, da, 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 ba, da, 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 that one. And it, as it occurs originally, and then in its upside down version, there's just like a one second pause between them that I threw in there, just so you can hear the difference. But it's the same tune, in this, it's the same rhythm. Do, 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 do. <laughs> that's, that's the rhythm. And that's what you're going to hear, right side up and upside down. So here it is. Isn't it astonishing what Grieg is able to extract from his use of harmony over a perfectly regular melody? I mean, this melody could not be more regular. It occurs like so many very regular pieces of music in four and eight bar phrases. I mean, each phrase is four bars. The whole tune is eight bars. So each repetition is eight bars. There's no, no variation, no variation in the rhythm. And it, he just plays it absolutely straight. But it's that very regularity that allows the changing harmony to take center stage and to create this unbelievably expressive and incredibly sad, which is what it is, piece of music, elegiac piece of music. It's touching, it's incredibly touching and sensitive. And, and the death, the moment of death is so serene, but also so hushed. It's, oh, it's just amazing. 
Absolutely amazing. And we're going to run the whole piece. And then I'll have one more thing to add to it. And we will have investigated this particular piece and the quality of harmony and harmonic quality <laughs> as well. Quality harmonies, however you want to put it. Anyway, um, let's listen to the entire piece all the way through. It's about four minutes long. It's just exquisite. And once you've heard it, which you just have, hum it to yourself. It's not going to sound very good. You'll, you'll hear, it, hear it in your head, and it sounds glorious. Then you, you, you hum it, and you go, da, da, da. And it's like, ugh, that's all? It doesn't exist apart from Grieg's harmonies. 
I mean, it's just, it's an, it's an integral part of the musical expression. It's really quite astonishing. Now, you may recall in our last talk on In the Hall of the Mountain King, I mentioned the fact that it was originally, at least partly, a vocal work. And we talked about the difference between music that accompanies voices and music that exists for itself and how the music that exists for itself can actually be much more powerful than music that accompanies the voices, but in a different way. Because whereas the voices are expressing specific words and specific ideas, which sort of trap the music in that box, freed from that, the music can be expressive of many different things simultaneously, all of which are correct, but extremely intensely so. And that's what's so marvelous about it. Well, it so happens. One of the things I talked about and mentioned is melodrama. That's music over spoken dialogue. Now, it turns out that Ossie's death originally in the play was the prelude to the third act. It was played basically just the way we heard it as the opening of the third act. Now, all kinds of stuff happens in the third act and dialogue and whatnot. And then finally, Ossie dies with Piergin at her side. And at the moment when she starts to die, this is the music we hear behind the dialogue. We hear it all over again. And I want to play you a little bit. Now they're talking in Norwegian. You're not going to understand it. It doesn't make any difference. I just want you to hear what it sounds like because imagine now for a moment, here's another quality that music adds that is a uniquely musical quality. It adds to the, our perception, our understanding of the drama that's going on because we've heard this beautiful, beautiful piece. And then we've sat through act three and all of a sudden she started to die and the music comes back. And then we know, we know what that music represented, what we had heard, that the music foretold what was going to happen in the third act. It's a wonderful, wonderful moment. And that's Grieg. That wasn't Ibsen, the playwright. That was Grieg, the musician, who did it this way because he knew that the music could could immeasurably add to and increase the power of the words, the pathos of the scene by forcing us at once to listen to what's happening on the stage, but at the same time to remember something that we've already heard, something that we already formed an opinion of, which only now crystallizes into the dramatic meaning it has within the context of the play. It's just a, a, a beautiful, beautiful moment. And I want you to hear just a little bit of it. I'm not going to play, like I said, too much of it so that the people talking in Norwegian, unless you're Norwegian, um, so that they don't drive you crazy. So here it is, the moment where Ozzy's death becomes Ozzy's death in the play. Mor, du fryser vel ei? Jo, jo, det kjennes på farten når grane legger i vei. Kjære Per, hva er det som ringer? De blanke dombjeller, mor. Oh, nei da. Hvor hult de klinger. Nu kjører vi over en fjord. Jeg er redd. Hva er det som bruser og sukker så underlig vilt? Det er granene, mor, som suser på moren. Isn't that great? It's almost worth sitting through it, Norwegian, just to hear the moment. Well, maybe not. Okay, I get it. I get it. But again, we're seeing the different things that music can do. But because this is great music, because it's music of distinction, personalized and expressively distinct from anything else anybody ever wrote, ever in the history of music, that scene becomes something tremendously special because the music is tremendously special. Take away the music and it's, yeah, it's a touching death scene, you know, like a million touching death scenes in a million other plays. But with Grieg's music, oh my, there's something else entirely. It's really, it's really quite, quite special, I think. A wonderful, wonderful moment. And I want to close this little talk with um, a statement a statement by Sanson about harmony, about music. 
And I think it's a very, very meaningful statement. I was trying to look it up and I couldn't find where it came from and maybe he didn't say it. It may be apocryphal, but it should have been real <laughs> if he didn't say it. This is what the statement is. He said, anybody who cannot appreciate the beauty of a simple series of chords that are perfect only in their, in their spacing, their voicing, and their relationship to each other doesn't really understand anything about music. And he was right. He was right because harmony is one of the essential musical qualities. And as you listen, the more you listen, the more you will appreciate the special sound of individual composers in their handling of harmony. And, and it's, it's just, it's such a wonderful thing to be able to listen to a piece of music and say, oh, I know who wrote that. Well, how do you know? Well, because it just sounds like them. When you're saying, well, it just sounds like them, you're saying, yes, I understand the harmonic language that they're speaking. And it's a personal one. And, and that's what harmony contributes to our music. Now, why it, it impresses us, why it makes us feel something, why some of it strikes some people as just glorious and other people is like, who knows? Everybody has their own approach. Everybody has their own perception. And there again, there's no right or wrong in it, but it's there and it's special and it's musically special. So the only way to acquire knowledge of the musically special is to listen to lots of special music, right? It's that easy, folks. There's no special education required here. All you need to do is listen. Just listen carefully, listen frequently, listen until you get the stuff into your head and internalize it and it speaks to you. But it should speak to you, something that speaks to you right away. I, you know, I, I, I am so not a member of the castor oil music is good for you crowd. It should only be something that strikes you as wonderful the first time you hear it. And later in your life, if you decide that music is like so amazing that you really want to get into it, you can start listening to things, hoping that they will strike you if they don't do it right away, if you have the time. But it, normally there's so much music out there. There's so much choice that there's got to be a billion things that are going to strike you immediately as fabulous. And so listen to those, listen to those. I'm just telling you what the musical qualities it will have are so that you know when you're listening that if something hits you in a certain way and it's special and you think about it, you say, ah, okay, that's, that's the harmonic element. We heard the harmonic element and we're going to hear many other elements as we continue to discuss the Peer Gint Suite. So get out there and listen to anything you want or listen to this, which is just fabulous. I hope you agree. Keep on listening, folks. Thank you so much for joining me. Take care.